Welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm Lisa Martin, excited to welcome back one of our distinguished alumni, Derek Mankey joins me next. Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances at Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs. Derek, welcome back to the program. Hey, it's great to be here and great to see you again, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Likewise, yeah, so a lot has happened. I know I've seen you during this virtual world, but so much has happened with ransomware in the last year. It's unbelievable. You know, we had dramatic shift to a distributed workforce and you had personal devices on in network perimeters and non-trusted devices uh, or trusted devices on home networks and lots of change there. Talk to me about some of the things that you and FortiGuard Labs have seen with respect to the evolution of ransomware. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's so, so it, it's becoming worse, no doubt. Um, you know, we highlighted this in, in our threat landscape report. If we just take a step back looking at ransomware itself, it actually started in the late 1980s. Um, and it didn't, you know, it, that was very, they, it relied on snail mail. It was, it was obviously there was no market for it at the time. It was just a proof of concept, a failed experiment, if you will. Uh, but it really started getting hot a decade ago, 10 years ago. Uh, but the technology back then was the cryptography they're using, the technique wasn't as strong as easily reversed. And so they didn't really get to um, a lot of revenue or business from a cyber criminal perspective. That is absolutely not the case today. Now they have very strong cryptography. They're experts when they say they, the cyber criminals at their game, they know there's a lot of the attack surface has grown. There's a lot of vulnerable people out there. There's a lot of vulnerable devices. And this is what we saw in our threat landscape report. We saw a seven times increase in, in ransomware activity in the second half of uh, 2020. And that momentum is continuing in 2021. It's being fueled by, by what you just talked about, by the work from anywhere, work from home environment, a lot of uh, vulnerable devices unpatched. Um, and, and these are, you know, these are the vehicles that the ransomware is the payload, of course, that's the way that they're monetizing this. Uh, but the reality is that the, the attack surface has expanded. Um, there's more, uh, more, more vulnerable people and cyber criminals are absolutely capitalizing on that. Right, we've even seen cyber criminals capitalizing on the pandemic fears with things that were around the World Health Organization or COVID-19 or going after healthcare. Did you see an uptick in healthcare uh, threats and activities as well in the last year? Yeah, definitely. So I, I would start to say that first of all, the um, no nobody is immune when it comes to ransomware. This is such a uh, you know a, again a, a hot um, you know target or technique that the cyber criminals are using. So when we look at the verticals, absolutely, healthcare is in in the top five that we've seen. But the key difference, Lisa, is that um, there's two two houses here, right? You have the what we call the broad blanketed ransomware attacks. So these aren't going after any particular vertical. Um, they're really just trying to spray as much as they can through through uh, phishing campaigns. Now through uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of web traffic out there. Um, we see a lot of a lot of things that are used to open um, you know, playing on that COVID nineteen theme again, right? Emails from HR or tax season scams. It, it's all related to ransomware because these are how they're trying to get the masses to open that up pay some data to, uh, sorry, pay, pay some cryptocurrency to get access to their data back. Um, oftentimes they're being held for extortion saying they have, you know, photos or video or audio captures from, from you know, it's a lot of fear they're trying to instill these people. Uh, but probably the more concerning is, is just what you talked about, healthcare, operational technology, um, these uh, large business revenue streams, these are take cases of targeted ransom, which is much different because instead of a big volumetric attack, these are premeditated. They're going after with specific targets in mind, specific social engineering lures, and they know that they're hitting uh, the, the corporate assets, or you know, in the case of healthcare, critical systems um, where it hurts. They know that uh, there's high stakes, and so they're demanding um, high returns in terms of ransom as well. With respect to the broad ransomware attacks versus targeted, a couple of questions to kind of. Uh, dissect that, are the targeted attacks, are they in like behind the network firewall longer and faster, longer and getting more information? Are they are they demanding higher ransom versus the broader attacks? What's, what are some of the distinctions there besides yeah. what you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the, the targeted attacks are more about execution, right? So if we look at the attack chain, they're doing more on, in terms of reconnaissance, they're spending more cycles and investment really on their end in terms of weaponization, how they can actually get into the system, how they can remain undetected, um, collect and gather information. 
what we're seeing with groups like Ragnar Walker as an example, they're going in and they're collecting, uh, in some cases, uh, terabytes of information, a lot. They're going after uh, definitely intellectual property, things like source code, uh, also PII for customers as an example, and they're holding them. Uh, they have a whole business strategy and plan in, on, in mind on their place, right? They hold them for ransom. They're often, it's essentially a denial of service in some cases, um, taking you know a revenue stream or, or applications offline so a business can't function and then what they're doing is that they're actually setting up crime services on their end they, they a lot of the the newest ransom notes that we're seeing in these targeted attacks are setting up channels to what they call a live chat support channel uh, that that the victim would log into and actually talk direct directly live to the cyber criminal or one of their associates to be able to negotiate the ransom and they're trying to have you know in, in their point of view they're trying to frame this as a good thing and say uh, you know we're going to show you that our technology works we can decrypt some of the the files on your system as an example just to prove that we are who we, you know we say we are uh, but then they go on to say you know instead of um, you know 10 million dollars we can negotiate down to six million this is a good deal you're getting 30 percent off or whatever it is and um, it, the, the, but the fact is that they know, you know, by the time they've gotten to this, they've done all their homework before that, right? They've done the targets, they've done all, all the things that they can to know that they that they have the organization, um, you know, in, in their grasp, right? I, one of the things that you mentioned, just I, something I never thought about is ransomware as a business. Yeah. The sophistication level is is just growing and growing and growing, and of course, even though they're bad actors, they have access to all the emerging technologies that the good guys do. But talk to me about this business of ransomware, because that's what it seems like it really has become. Absolutely. It, it, it is massively sad. And if you look at the cybercrime ecosystem, like the way that they're actually uh, pulling this off, it's not just one, one individual or one cybercrime ring that, let's say, five to 10 people that are trying to orchestrate this. These are big rings. We actually work closely as an example to, you know, we're, we're doing everything from the you know, Fortigar Labs with following the latest ransomware trends, doing the protection and mitigation, but also working to find out who these people are. Um, what are their tactics and really attribute and paint a picture of, uh, of, of these organizations and they're big. You know, we've worked on some cases where there's over 50 people just in one ransomware gang. Uh, one of the cases we worked on, they were making over $60 million US in three months, uh, as an example. Uh, and in some cases, keep in mind, one of these targeted attacks, like in terms of ransom demands in the, in the um, targeted cases, they can be in excess of $10 million just for one ransom attack. And like I said, we're seeing a seven, a seven time increase in the amount of attack activity. And you know what they're doing in terms of the business is they've set up affiliate marketing, essentially. They have um, affiliates in the middle that will actually distribute the ransomware. So, if, so they're basically outsourcing this to other individuals. If they hit people with the ransomware and, they, and, the, and the people pay, then the, the, the affiliate in the middle will actually get a commission cut of that. Very high, typically 40 to 50%. And that's really what's making this a lucrative business model too. Wow, my jaw is dropping just at the sophistication, but also the different levels to which they've put a business together. And unfortunately for every industry, it sounds very lucrative. So how then Derek, do organizations protect themselves against this, especially knowing that a lot of this work from home stuff is going to persist. Some yeah. people want to stay home, whatnot. The proliferation of devices is only going to continue. So where do organizations start and how can you guys help? Start with the people. So we'll talk about three things, people, uh, technology, and processes. The people, unfortunately, it's not. this is not just about ransomware, but definitely applies to ransomware, but any attack. Um, humans are still often the weakest link in terms of education, right? A lot of these ransomware uh, campaigns will be uh, going after people using nowadays seems like tax themes purporting to be from the IRS as an example, or, or human resources departments or governments and health authorities, vaccination scams, all these things, right? Um, but what they're trying to do is to get people to click on that link still to open up a, a malicious attachment that will then infect them with the ransomware. Uh, this, of course, if an employee is up to date on, and hones their skills uh, so that they know, you know, basically a zero trust mentality is what I like to talk about. Um, you wouldn't just invite a stranger into your house to open a package that you didn't order, but people are doing this a lot of the times with email. Um, so 
really starting with the people first is important. Uh, there's a lot of free training, information and security awareness, awareness training. We offer that at Fortinet. Uh, there's even advanced training we do through uh, our NSE program as an example. But then on top of that, there's things like, um, you know, a phishing test that you can do regularly, penetration testing as well. Exercises like that are very important because that is really the first line of defense. Uh, moving past that, you want to get into the technology piece. And of course, there's a whole, this is a, a security fabric. There's a whole um, array of solutions. Um, like I said, um, everything needs to be integrated. So we have EDR and XDR as an example, uh, sitting on the endpoint, because um, oftentimes they still need to get that ransomware payload to run on the endpoint. So having technology like EDR is, uh, goes a long way to be able to detect the threat, uh, quarantine and block it. Um, there's also, of course, uh, multi-factor authentication when it comes to identifying who's connecting uh, to these environments. Um, patch management, we talk about all the time. That's part of the technology piece. You know, uh, the reality is that we highlight in the threat landscape report, the software vulnerabilities that these ransomware gangs are going after are two to three years old. They're not breaking within the last month or so. They're two to three years old. So it's still about the patch management cycle, um, having that that holistic integrated, uh, um, you know, um, security architecture in the fabric is really important. Um, NAC, network, network access control, and zero trust network access is really important as well. One of the biggest culprits we're seeing with these ransom attacks is using IoT devices as launch pads, as an example, into networks, because they're in these work from home environments and there's a lot of unsecured or uninspected devices sitting on those networks. Um, finally, process, right? So uh, it's always good to have all in, in your defense plan, training and education, uh, technology for mitigation, but then also thinking about the what if scenario, right? So incident response planning, what do we do if we get hit? Uh, of course, we never recommend to pay the ransom. So it's good to have a, a plan in place. It's, it's good to have the, uh, uh, you know, um, identify what your corporate assets are and that the likely targets that cyber criminals are gonna go after. And make sure that you have rigid security controls and threat intelligence like FortiGuard Labs uh, applied to that. Yeah, you, you know, you talk about the weakest link there are people. I know you and I have talked about that on numerous segments. It's one of the biggest challenges, but I've, I've seen some uh, people that are really experts in security read a phishing email and almost fall for it. Like it looked so legitimately from like their bank, for example. So in that case, what are some of the things that, that businesses can do when it looks so legitimate that it probably is gonna have a, unfortunately a good conversion rate? Yeah, so so this is what I was talking about earlier that let these targeted attacks, especially when it comes to spear phishing, when it comes to the reconnaissance, they get so clever, it can become so realistic uh, that the uh, it's it becomes a very effective weapon. And that's why the sophistication and the risk is rising, like I said. But that's why you want to have this multi-layered approach, right? So if that first line of defense does fail, if they do click on the link, if they do uh, try to open the malicious attachment, First of all, again, through next generation firewall, sandboxing, solutions like that, um, this technology is capable of inspecting that, acting like, you know, if this, uh, we even have uh, 40 AI as an example, artificial intelligence, machine learning that can actually scan this in advance to know, is this actually an attack? So that element goes a long way to actually scrub it, like content CDR as well, content uh, uh, disarm um, uh, as an example, this is a way to actually scrub that content so it doesn't actually run in the first place. But if it does run again, this is where EDR comes in, like I said, at the end of the day, they're also trying to um, get information out of the network. So having things like uh, botnet protection uh, through the next generation firewall, uh, like, uh, like, like they have with FortiGuard um, security sub subscription services is really important too. So it's all about that layered approach. You don't want just one single point of failure. Um, you really want, it's, this is what we call the attack chain and the kill chain. There's no magic bullet when it comes to attackers moving. They have to go through a lot of uh, phases uh, to reach their end game. So having that layered defense approach and blocking it at any one of those phases is, um, so even if that the human does click on it, um, you're still mitigating the attack and protecting the damage. Keep in mind a lot of damage in some cases, $10 million plus. Right, is that the average ransom, 10 million US dollars? 
So the average cost of data breaches that we're seeing, which are often related to ransom attacks, is close to that in the U.S. I believe it's around just under $9 million, about $8.7 million just for one data breach. And often those data breaches now, again, what's happening is that the data, it's not just about encrypting the data, getting access, because a lot of organizations, um, you know, part of the, the technology piece and the process that we recommend is backups as well of data. I would say organizations are getting better at that now, but it's one thing to back up your data, but if that data is breached, again, cyber criminals are now moving to this model of extorting that, saying, unless you pay us this money, we're gonna go out and make this public, we're gonna put it on pavement, we're gonna sell it to nefarious people on, on, on the dark web as well. One more thing I wanna ask you, in terms of proliferation, we talked about the distributed workforce, but one of the things and here we are using Zoom to talk to each other instead of getting to sit together in person. We saw this massive proliferation in um, collaboration tools to keep people connected, families, businesses. I talked to bit, a lot of businesses who initially will say, oh, we're using you know, Microsoft 365 and they're protecting the data. Well, they're not, or Salesforce or Slack. And that shared responsibility model is something that I've been hearing a lot more about lately that businesses needing to recognize for those cloud applications that we're using and in, in, in which there's a lot of data tra traversing that could include PII or IP, we're responsible for that as the customer to protect our data. The vendor is responsible for protecting the integrity of the infrastructure. Share with us a little bit about that in terms of your thoughts on like data protection and backup for those SaaS applications. Yeah, great question. Great question. Tough one. You know, it's it's it is so. I mean, ultimately, everybody has has to have. I believe it has to have. Um, you know, their position in this. It's not. It is a collaborative environment. Everyone has to be a stakeholder in this. Even down to the end users, the employees being educated and up to date. As an example, the in, um, IT departments and security operations centers of vendors being able to do all the threat intelligence and scrubbing. But then, when you extend that to the public cloud, what does the cloud security stack look at? Right? How integrated is that? Are there scrubbing and protection controls sitting on the cloud environments? Um, what data is being sent to that? Um, should it be sent? Uh, as an example, what's the retention period? How long does the data live on there? It's the same thing as you know when you go out and you buy one of these IoT devices, as an example, from a um, say a big box store, and you go and plug it into your network. It's the same questions we should be asking, right? Um, what, what's the security like on this device model? Who's making it? What data is it going to ask for me? Same thing when you're installing an application on on your mobile phone. That that is this is what I mean about that zero trust environment. It should be earned trust. Uh, so it's a big thing, right, to be able to ask those questions and then only do it on a sort of um, you know, need need to know and uh, and uh, you know need to implement basis. You know, the good news is that a lot of the cloud um, stacks now and environments are integrating security controls. We integrate quite well with Fortinet as an example. But this is an issue of supply chain. Uh, it's really important to know um, what lives upstream and how they're handling the data and how they're protecting it. Absolutely. Such interesting information, and it's a topic ransomware that we could continue talking about. Derek, thank you for joining me on the program today, updating us on what's going on, how it's evolving, and ultimately what organizations in any industry need to do with respect to people and technology and processes to really start reducing their risk. I thank you so much for joining me today. All right, it's a pleasure, take care. Likewise, for Derek Mankey, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching this CUBE Conversation 